Hello everyone. In the first lecture, we discussed about the historical aspects of the the phenomena of radioactivity, and also the how the you know how the you know different uh, types of radioisotopes are there, whether they are occurring naturally or they are produced artificially, and how they find you know these applications in different areas. Today we will go into the fundamentals of radioactive decay and as usual i will just briefly mention that at the end of this lecture you should be able to answer these questions for example what is radioactive decay law what is half life and how to measure it from the experimental data what is mean life of a radioisotope what are the units of radioactivity how does the activity of a daughter nucleide depend upon that of the parent activity and how does the radioactive decay in the case of branchy so we we'll discuss this detail in the details of this lecture okay so let us discuss first the radioactive decay law we have just taken example of a radio isotope a which is undergoing some decay it could be alpha or beta or gamma to b so the a is called the parent and b is called the daughter so henceforth when we say parent means it is the parent isotope which is decaying and whatever is formed we call it daughter now the radioactive decay law is like you know chemical kinetics in chemistry in chemistry you have the order of a reaction like if a going to b you may say it is a first order reaction radioactive decay also follows the first order rate law and in the first order rate law the rate of decay that is if n is the number of atoms of the reactant at any point of time then minus dn by dt is the rate of decay of the atoms per unit time is proportional to the number of atoms at that point of time and if you remove the proportionality constant this lambda becomes the proportionality constant so the rate equation for radioactive decay becomes minus dn by dt equal to lambda n so this is a first order rate equation and if you want to find a solution of this equation you integrate this equation so if it is an indefinite integral so minus dn you arrange the variables a minus dn by dn by n equal to n integration dt plus a integration constant c so now you can put the limits here that is the solution of this will become ln n equal to lambda t plus c so when you now how do you find the c when t equal to 0 n equal to n0 so you put this condition minus ln n0 equal to c because t is 0 so you get minus ln n equal to lambda t plus ln c ln n0 rather it will be minus ln n0 so it will become minus ln n upon n0 equal to lambda t or you can say n upon n0 equal to e raised to minus lambda t this is what is the expression for the decay of a radioisotope so n is the number of atoms decaying with time and the number of atoms decay exponentially with time 
n0 is the initial number of atoms. So, the exponential decay of radioactivity is the signature of first order rate law that governs the radioactive decay law. So, this I have shown here as a function of time, if you plot the number of atoms, then activity follows exponential decay. Now, from this graph, you can, if you want to find out the term called half-life. So, what is half-life? Half-life is the time when the number of atoms have become half. So, suppose initially there were n0 atoms, the time when the atoms left are n0 by 2, we will call it the half-life. So, you can just draw uh, the, on this graph, find out the time when the active number of atoms have become half. So, from the exponential data, it may be difficult graphically to find out the uh, half-life, but you, you can, we will discuss very soon how to make it more accurate. So, when n equal to n0 by 2, t equal to t half, and so, you can substitute the value of t in this equation and find out what is the value of t half. So, t half will become ln 2 by lambda. How do you do that? You can see here that is n upon n0 equal to e raised to minus lambda t. To take the logarithm ln n by n0 equal to minus lambda t. And so, lambda, so it becomes, so when n, n by n0 is 1 by 2, lambda t equal to ln n0 by 2, n0 by n, and n, n is nothing but n0 by 2. So, it becomes ln 2, and lambda t becomes t half. So, you can see here, lambda becomes equal to ln 2 by t half or t half equal to ln 2 by lambda and so it is ln 2 is natural log of 2 is 0 0.693 upon lambda. So, this is the relationship between half life and decay constant. So, if you find out the half life from graphically from this exponential decay, you can find out the lambda or later on I will show you that if you find the lambda then you can find out t half from a another type of plot which I have shown this one. Now, most of the time we do not determine the number of atoms, what we determine is the activity. So, the activity is nothing but the number of atoms decaying per unit time. So, minus dn by dt is nothing but activity, atoms decaying per second and it is given by n lambda that you see from here. So, activity is nothing but number of atoms into lambda. So, activity becomes equal to a0 e raised to minus lambda t. So, you can if you plot activity functions as a function of time, this also will follow the exponential decay because lambda is a constant. So, before we proceed further, since we when we do measurements, we do not measure the activity directly. We measure the counts. Our detector system gives you counts and so if you say counts per second, we have to convert into activity. There are some factors called detection efficiency and so on. So, the units of activity like activity we will call as minus dn by dt, number of atoms decaying per second equal to n lambda. So, this is called disintegrations per second and to honor the discoverer of the phenomenon of radioactivity, we have a unit of 1 becquerel is equal to 1 disintegration per second. Also, there is another unit of radioactivity called Curie in the name of Madame Curie and one Curie is 3.7 10 power 10 becquerels. So, you can see the Curie is a much bigger unit compared to becquerel. So, how, do, how does this number come about? This 3.7 10 power 10 becquerel actually is the activity due to 1 gram of 226 radium. Radium was discovered by Madame Curie and therefore, the activity of 1 gram of 226 radium has been defined as 1 Curie. Now, you can find out the in terms of uh, becquerels what will be equal to 1 Curie. The half-life for 226 
radium is 1600 years. So you put in the equation activity equal to n lambda, number of atoms in 1 gram of 226 radium will be Avogadro number 6.023 atoms in 226 gram. This is the n in 1 gram into 0.693 upon t half that is lambda. So 600 years into 365 days per year into 24 hours per day into 3600 seconds per hour. So the, the units get cancelled and so you have seconds. So you have atoms per second. And so if you do the calculation, it will come to 3.7 10 power 10 atoms per second or becquerels. So the Curie is a very, very large unit. You can see the one gram of 226 radium is very difficult to handle. So normally we don't handle Curie level of activity. We handle in fact even less than micro Curie level of activity. So there are other units called milli Curie, 10 power minus 3 Curie, 3.7 10 power 7 becquerels, micro Curie, 10 power minus 6 Curie, 3.7 to the power 4 becquerels. Sometimes you know, we can have even nano curie also. So, for activity handling in the laboratory, people use becquerels, 1 becquerel, 10 becquerel. But if you are using for industrial applications, like a radiation source or irradiation, you may be handling hundreds of curies. Now, let us go a little further. I was mentioning about determining the half life from the decay data using the activity. So activity is A A0 e raised to 1 lambda t where A0 is the initial activity. So just a little bit of manipulation. If you see if I take the logarithm on both sides that ln A is ln A0 minus lambda t and now you see this becomes a straight line of ln A versus t. So you see here what I have plotted here is ln A on the y axis and time on the x axis and it becomes a straight line. So it becomes easy to understand and handle loss. So the slope of this line is lambda and from the activity data also you can now find out the half life using a using a paper which I will call it semi-log paper because on the y-axis I have the logarithmic unit on the x-axis we have the linear unit and so when we do when we plot activity actually we will be plotting the count rate so the activity of radio stop is disintegration per second but when we have the experimental data we will have the count rate in detector and the count rate can be counts per unit time it could be counts per second it could be counts per minute and so on so that I will discuss now in more detail and it would be very interesting if you understand uh, to follow this semi-log paper. What I have shown here is a semi-logarithmic paper. On the x-axis we have the time. Let us say it is hours. So 1, 2, 3, 4 hours. So this is larger graduations you can see. Uh, there are the, the bold lines on the x-axis you will find. Uh, vertical parallel to y-axis they are one two three this is in time in linear scale and on the y-axis you see say the scale already made in logarithmic units so it is cycles you have 10 here 100 here 1000 here so it's called three cycle paper you can plot the data on three orders of magnitude 10 to 100 100 to 1000 1000 to 10,000 and so on so now when you plot the, act, the counts on this scale, you don't have to convert the counts into log because the scale is adjusted like that. So you see here, when I say 100, next point is 200, 300, 400, so on. When you have 1000 here, then you have 2000, 3000 and so on. So if you understand how to use a semi-log paper, activity data handling is very, very simple. So what I have plotted here, the decay of a radioisotope on a semi-log paper and as I discussed in the previous slide also, even here also you can see the logarithm of the counts versus time will be a straight line. Now instead of ln natural log, you plot here the log base to the power 10 
and so logarithmic plot of uh, activity will have a straight line behavior and now from here suppose initial counts was 1000 when counts become 500 so this is 500 at this time and you can read on the x axis the time is 2 hours so straight away from the semilog paper you can find out the half life in a much simpler way once you find out the half life you can find out the decay constant lambda equal to 0.693 upon t now there is another quantity called mean life so the what is mean life mean life is the average time a radionuclide survives half life is when half the atoms have decayed or half the atoms have survived so from the radioactive decay law n equal to n0 this one lambda t let us find out how many atoms survive or what is the time required for the survival of radionuclide on the average so if you find a, if you have a function and you want to find out the, uh, the average how do you find out so you want to find out the mean value of t so you can take the t dn integrate over 0 to n0 divided by the total number of atoms that is integration of dn over 0 to n0 so now you can write here now dn equal to the derivative of n here so dn will be n0 lambda e raised to minus lambda t upon n0 so you can see now the, the variable has changed from n to t and so the limits of will become 0 to infinity instead of 0 to n0 because the radioactive decay that exponential decay now the, the, the curve will meet the uh, x axis at infinite time and therefore the time can go from 0 to infinity upon the integral of this this will become n0 so what you have here is now n0 will cancel so you will have lambda t e raised to minus lambda t dt and if you solve this integral you will find it will become 1 by lambda you can do it at your home and find out whether it becomes equal to 1 by lambda now the the one, there is one more way of deriving the expression n equal to n0 equal lambda t based on statistics in statistics we say lambda the decay constant the probability of decay of an atom in unit time so if you, that is the definition of lambda then what is the probability of survival in unit time 1 minus lambda lambda is the probability of decay the probability of survival is 1 minus lambda you have a unit time in interval delta t let us say in delta t what is the probability of survival of an atom it will be 1 minus lambda delta t and now you want to find out what is the probability of survival till time t then this time t we can define in terms of n delta t that means you divide this time interval into a large number of delta t intervals n intervals so it becomes 1 minus lambda delta t to the power n you just multiply the probabilities over the n intervals and now when delta t becomes very small or n becomes very large so n tending to infinity 1 minus e raised to minus lambda t upon n to the power n so this is actually you will see limit n tends to infinity 1 minus e raised to minus lambda t upon upon n to the power n will be will tend to no it is not e raised to 1 minus lambda t upon n it will become e raised to minus lambda t and so what you have here is the the probability of survival till time t becomes e raised to minus lambda t when n becomes very large so the fraction if there are n zero atoms in the beginning 
what is the fraction of atoms that survive till time t n by n0 equal to this to minus lambda t so you have n equal to n0 is to minus lambda t so that is how from the fundamental definition of lambda as a probability of decay of an atom per unit time also you can derive the expression for radioactive decay okay now there will be many situations when you will encounter two independently decaying radioisotopes so you have a1 and a2 are two isotopes decaying independently they are independent of each other so a1 is decaying with its own half life a2 decaying with its own half life but it's a mixture of activity so when you plot such a activity on a similar paper so i am saying ln a essentially i am plotting on a similar paper so you see here the total activity will be the red line now from so how to resolve this such a data on a similar paper when the when the the half life of the two isotopes are different so at a much later time when the short lived isotope has decayed you can extrapolate the linear portion to zero time and what you get is the activity of the short lived isotope a long lived isotope and when you subtract this activity of this long lived isotope from the total activity you get this data that is the pure activity of short lived isotope so extrapolation to zero time gives you initial activity of the two isotopes and from the slope of these two you can find out their half lives so you can using log semilog papers you can resolve the mixture of two activities into individual isotopes half lives and their initial activities there is another case of branching decay that means the same radio isotope decays by two modes so a going to b and c with different decay constants lambda 1 and lambda 2 now in such a case so the 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 decay of the parent you can say minus dn a by dt equal to n a lambda a which is nothing but the the growth of a b and c separately now the this you can write dnb by dt as lambda 1a and dn lambda this is lambda 2a so this the decay to b and c can be written as now lambda 1a these are two branches of decay of a so they this is lambda 1a is first part lambda 2 is second part you take na as separate become lambda 1 plus lambda 2 into na so this is becomes the decay constant for the radio isotope a is the sum of the decay constant for the two branches it is like you know if you have a tank and it has got two outlets to empty it and you open both the taps then the tank will decay empty and depending upon the diameter of the two taps you know the flow will be different the time taken to empty will be different so it is similar to that so this equation lambda equal to lambda 1 plus lambda 2 you can replace lambda 1 by t half 0.693 upon t half is for the parent equal to 0.693 upon t half 1 for the lambda 1 and 0.693 upon t half 2 for lambda 2 so you can cancel the 0.693 that is the ln 2 so 1 by t is 1 by t1 plus 1 by t2 or t t is equal to the half life of the parent equal to t1 to t upon t1 plus t2 that is t1 t2 are called the partial half lives for decay into b and c so the relationship between the half partial half lives for the two branches to the parent uh, half life is the way so but when you measure the activity of either b or c the half life that you will get that of the parent because if if you measure the rate using one tap in a tank or another tank the tank is getting empty anyway it is decaying by both the taps so the half life that you will get while measuring either b or c will be the 
average half life of the the device. So this is a important like I will give you an example where uh, this is the isotope copper sixty four. The copper sixty four, if you recall, uh, I will I will tell you later on in the in terms of the masses. You no, know, it can decay by both beta plus as well as beta minus. So in beta plus decay, it becomes nickel sixty four, and beta minus decay becomes zinc sixty four. Now. The average half life. So when you do the measurement of half life of copper sixty four, you get twelve point seven hours. But when you calculate the partial half life, so you calculate partial half life of uh, this copper sixty four for beta plus decay or beta minus decay. I am writing here beta plus comma electron capture that we will discuss in radioactive decay, de in nuclear decay data. But right now we will assume that this is the one channel. Beta plus E C is one channel. So this is called electron capture. When beta plus decay does not happen, then there is a competing mode of decay to beta plus decay that is called electron capture. We will discuss this more details in the nuclear decay. So now decay constant for copper sixty four is point six nine three upon t half, and that t half is twelve point seven hours. So you can write this equal to point zero five six four hour inverse. Now, how do we get the partial half lives for decay into nickel sixty four and zinc sixty four? We set up two equations: lambda one plus lambda two is equal to point zero five four six. That is the lambda, and lambda one by lambda two. So here the branching intensities are given. Sixty one percent of the time, nickel sixty four is formed. Thirty nine percent of the time, zinc sixty four is formed. So I can write lambda one upon lambda two is point six one upon point three nine, and that is one point five six four. So I have two equations: lambda one plus lambda two equal to point zero five four six. Lambda one by lambda two point six one by one point five six four. So I can solve these two equations to find out lambda one and lambda two. So lambda two is equal to point zero two one three hour inverse. Lambda one equal to point zero Three 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 hour inverse, and now we can convert this lambda into half life. They are called as the partial half life. You see here, the partial half life for decay to nickel sixty four is twenty point eight hours. The partial half life for decay to zinc sixty four is thirty two hours, and the average half life is twelve hours. So you just see here, the partial half lives are more than the average half life because. It is decaying by both roots, so it is less than both the half lives. So what we discussed today was the radioactive decay and different types of decays, like the decay of a mixture of radioisotopes or the branching decay of a radioisotope into different modes like beta plus, beta minus, and so on. And so in the next lecture, I will discuss the radioactive decay chain and the, the growth and decay of the daughter products. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much.